Uh, very warm welcome from me as well. My name is Wenke Christoph. I'm a, a senior advisor for Europe here in the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. And uh, it is really my honor to um, moderate this first part of the event. Um, this afternoon we will um, talk about the garment industry and usually when you talk about the garment industry people have in their minds pictures from of course Rana Plaza from Bangladesh from Cambodia and so on and uh, but we are actually looking much much closer to Berlin to Europe at the um, garment industry in Ukraine and in Serbia so uh, which is not in such a great condition uh, even compared to Asia when it comes to wages, when it comes to working conditions. Um, and uh, we want to have a look at what is, what are these conditions, looking at the researches that are going to be, uh, to be presented here, what, but also what makes these conditions, how are they produced, and then what are responsibilities and possibilities to act to change these conditions, be it from the side of NGOs, be it from the side of unions, be it from the side of brands and companies that produce textiles. And of course also be it from the side of governments. The discussion on uh, this event is going to be structured in two parts. First we will have the presentations of the country profiles that you can also find uh, at these little tables and over there, the country profiles on Serbia and Ukraine. And uh, in the second part, I will hand over to De David Hachfeld, who will moderate a panel discussion on what to do with these findings. And for the first part now, I'm really glad to welcome here the researchers that worked very hard for the last months on these um, on these country profiles. First, Oksana Duczak, she's a researcher and co-author of the study on Ukraine on the country profile from uh, on Ukraine and the deputy director of the Center for Social and Labor Research in Kiev in Ukraine. Welcome. <laughs> As a second speaker, I'm glad to uh, welcome here Bojana Taminjia. She's from Serbia and co-author and researcher for the Serbia country profile. And she's also a board member and journalist of the web portal Machina in, from Belgrade. And uh, as the third woman here on our table, I want to welcome Bettina Musiolik. She is also co-author of the studies and will present a more regional frame for these, uh, uh, of these researches because she has worked on uh, the question of labor conditions, working conditions in the garment and shoe industry in Southeast and East Europe for many years for a clean clothes campaign. <laughs> so thank you three for coming and we uh, discussed it beforehand. So I will hand over now to Oksana and Bojana who will start with uh, presenting the country profiles. We decided to make uh, like a joint presentation because uh, we realized that there is a lot of uh, similarities between uh, Serbia and Ukraine in many aspects. So uh, we will lead you uh, shortly through the, our main, uh, uh, the most important findings from our researches and then I hope that later we will have opportunity to, to discuss it more in details. Here you can see uh, general information about uh, Serbia. Uh, the country has a total population of seven, seven million people uh, and uh, quite a small country but has uh, registered uh, 1,800 uh, 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 1, uh, garment and shoe factories and there is uh, 100,000 uh, workers employed in this sector. Half of this amount actually goes to uh, informal sector and also there is one increasing trend uh, in uh, garment industry in Serbia. So official estimates that in the next uh, uh, five years it will be like uh, 40,000 new working places in garment and shoe industry in Serbia. Uh, so as you can see on the uh, right side, the most important export destinations of Serbian garments and footwear are Italy and Germany, Germany, Russia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, which means that Italy and Germany are actually the most important players, uh, the most, Im the most uh, of the brands that are sourcing from Serbia are coming actually from Italy and Germany. 
So, next one. Uh, so this is um, a general picture of Ukrainian uh, Ukraine and garment sector in Ukraine. So you see that we have a bigger population of 42 millions. Um, we have approximately, it's an estimation, 6,000 uh, 6, of uh, uh, official and unofficial uh, garment factories and more than <coughs> 200,000 people working in formal and informal sector in garment in, in garment industry. Uh, the <coughs> so the absolute numbers are higher than in Serbia, but in relative term, um <coughs> It's uh, not that big for uh, comparing to other industrial uh, enterprises in Ukraine because Ukrainian industry is, farm, uh, is still uh, quite diversified. We still have heavy industry and that all. And also the share of um, garment in export is smaller than in Serbia. Uh, the main export destinations in value terms are Germany. It is the first main one. And uh, um, around 20% of export to Hungary, Poland and Romania uh, gives a hint that actually Ukrainian factories are often not the direct suppliers of brands, but uh, subcontractors of direct suppliers who are in these uh, three countries. And it's even more obvious for footwear, where, where uh, um, nearly 40% of the export is part of shoes and not even shoes. Next, please. Here we can see uh, and that blue part brands that are uh, sourcing from Serbia and that yellow one brands from uh, that are pre pre omnipresent in Ukraine. Uh, so you, we can see that uh, most important actually European brands are uh, present in uh, both countries. And this is definitely not the final list. Uh, this is according to our... Uh, uh, according to the media reports, according to supplier list, and according to the workers interviewed. So there is uh, much more brands that are for sure producing in Serbia and Ukraine as well. Next. So uh, this is the wage ladder for, uh, for Serbia. As you can see, the legal minimum net salary for 2017 is uh, 189 euros. Uh, Average net salary in garment industry is a bit uh, higher uh, and it is uh, 218 euros. Average net salary for uh, leather and uh, shoe industry is 227 euros. But what is interesting when we compare uh, legal minimum uh, net salary uh, with the poverty threshold uh, for family of four and uh, uh, with the minimum consumer basket for household, uh, then we can see that uh, legal minimum net salary uh, does not cover it, actually. And also, the higher gap is here between minimum living wage estimated by interviewed workers, actually what uh, uh, family, what are the real living costs in Serbia, uh, and uh, uh, what uh, uh, legal minimum net salary is, actually what uh, uh, workers are receiving. So, next one. Uh, so we can see here that uh, legal minimum wage is 29% of workers' estimated minimum living wage. Uh, however, it's two thirds of uh, the legal minimum salary is two thirds of official minimum consumer basket. Even if that consumer basket is not uh, really connected with the reality, because uh, uh, it's uh, just enough to cover the food costs. Uh, and what makes the situation even worse is despite the country's low minimum wage, approximately, actually, 50% uh, of workers do not receive the statutory minimum in Serbia. Next, please. Uh, this is the same picture for Ukraine, so you see the same picture of poverty wages in the sector. Uh, the legal minimum net wage for 2017 is 89 euros net. And uh, <coughs> it's um, partially due to the crisis, because which started in 2014, the, uh, because of inflation and currency devaluation, uh, the wages uh, decreased a lot. Uh, and uh, despite uh, the government doubled the legal minimum wage in 2017, it's still smaller than it was before the crisis in real terms of its purchasing power. The average net wage of the workers we interviewed is just slightly uh, more than the legal minimum wage at 96 euro with all the overtime and bonuses and so on. 
And in general, the garments, uh, the light industry, including garment sector, is the worst paid industry in the country with an um, average wage of 135 euros. The official subsistence minimum for three people, estimated officially by the government, is bigger than the legal minimum wage and bigger than what workers really get is 166 euros and actually the, uh, the real gap is even bigger because the ministry also calculate the actual living minimum not the legal one and it is almost twice higher than those uh, in the law uh, and the, um, so you see the that uh, garment sector is really poorly paid and uh, the wage is a poverty wage and the also like in Serbia the biggest gap is between uh, what workers uh, really receive and what they should receive to have a normal decent life uh, which is should be for 177 euros next please so in general, the legal minimum wage is 90% of the living wage estimated by workers and one-fifth or 20%, um, uh, they really get one-fifth or 20% of the living wage. And which is still half of the official subsistence minimum, though the subsistence minimum is uh, underestimated, definitely. And yet, as in Serbia, at least one-third of workers do not get the legal minimum wage for regular hours. Next, please. Uh, so we here have uh, working conditions. Uh, they are also similar in uh, Ukraine and Serbia. Uh, so what is common is uh, for sure disrespectful treatment of workers, uh, pressure from supervisors, pressures to meet the quotas, an omnipresent atmosphere of fear, and that constant threat of uh, dismissal or uh, 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 relocation. Also what is common is forced overtime, workers have to work overtime uh, uh, in order to be paid legal minimum wage that, that is mostly in Ukraine. But however, in Serbia, we have illegally excessive overtime, unpaid or which is unpaid or inadequately paid overtime, which means that uh, sometimes workers have to work like 12 hours per day or uh, uh, which comes to sometimes uh, 80 hours per month uh, of overtime. Uh, and uh, according to law, it should be not more than 40 hours. Uh, this uh, 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 restricted or banned toilet use is something which is common in uh, in uh, all the all the factories in in Serbia, and which is actually a violation of basic human rights. Uh, extreme temperatures in summer, in winter, uh, and winter that is also common in Serbia and Ukraine. Uh, and uh, this summer it was cause of uh, mass faintings in a couple of Serbian factories. Uh, in general, poor air quality at work, uh, uh, bad ventilation system, uh, etc. Uh, also, uh, no full annual leave granted, uh, which means that uh, in Ukraine also, yes, uh, workers are forced to have uh, annual leave uh, usually during the winter time and not during the summer when, when they eventually want it. So, next one, please. And we have here uh, 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 some quotes from uh, workers and uh, I will read a couple of them. Uh, this uh, first one on the right side is actually connected with uh, 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 that mass paintings that we had this summer in Serbia. Uh, so, management asked us to collect money for a blood pressure monitor for them to be able to play doctors at us when we faint and not call emergency doctor. Uh, I told the supervisor, I cannot breathe at this machine. It's already over 30 degrees in the factory and much hotter when we are working at the machine. After I said that, she took the machine's exhaust pipe and directed it at mine and my colleagues' faces and said, deal with it or the gate is over there. Uh, the air conditioning won't be turned on until we drop down dead in front of our machines. We know when somebody like an inspector or a manager, manager from Italy is going to visit the factory because beforehand management opens doors and windows and switches on the air conditioning. Normally, manager tell us if you open the door, you'll be, you will be fired immediately. Uh, and also, already in March, uh, it is uh, 30 degrees in the, in the factory. So all those quotes are connected with actually bad working conditions, high temperature uh, and the lack of uh, uh, ventilation system. 
Uh, and the same picture, some uh, some quotes to illustrate the picture was poverty wages and uh, um, uh, intensive overtime. So, for example, workers say um, that they receive four euros for the whole Saturday's work. And uh, um, another thing that, f uh, another quotation that my husband um, as a work as a watchman in Kiev uh, to uh, and a half hours away. He also earns uh, 97 euros, slightly higher than uh, the minimum wage. The money is not sufficient for anything, although we grow our own potatoes and our parents from the village help us with food. We are borrowing money all the time and pay it back from our wages. And uh, so the situation appears sometimes that, as some worker claims, uh, claimed, uh, there are times um, when we have nothing to eat. And uh, extensive overtime also was a huge issue, as we mentioned. Uh, and another quotation on this, in summer during high season, uh, we work every Saturday and uh, 10, 12 hours during weekdays. Sometimes we stay till the morning. We take this extreme overtime because it is the only period during the year when we can earn more. As as much as 138 euros. Next. Uh, so we decided to include this uh, slide because why do they stay uh, uh, and work in such bad working conditions and be so low uh, paid? Uh, because when uh, very first results of uh, the Ukrainian research appeared in the uh, media, it was a uh, 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 common question why do they stay, why do they not switch to another job, uh, better paid with better working conditions. So we tried to collect like uh, answers or, or a couple of reasons. And uh, my personal opinion is that this is a very hypocritical question uh, for sure. Uh, in Serbia, uh, we have actually high, not official, but uh, we have high unemployment rate. Uh, and also during the first decade of this century, uh, we lost 40% of working places in industry, so uh, there is a lack of choice for most of the workers, especially for young labor, uh, labor force. Uh, also, there is a fear to fall into informal sector. This is a case especially in Ukraine, where people are feared to, uh, afraid that they will lose uh, social benefits, uh, paid uh, sick leave or paid parental leave which they actually have uh, uh, in those factories, even if they are uh, uh, low paid. Uh, also, uh, one of the reasons, uh, one reason is restricted mobility of the workers, uh, because usually those uh, um, uh, uh, factories are uh, <coughs> established in uh, uh, poor or small cities, uh, where people uh, had their apartments and families and kids, so it's impossible to go uh, f just for higher salary in a bigger city and uh, 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 live that kind of life. Uh, also, what is important, uh, uh, and it's connected with that social benefits, it, it is stability of income. Uh, it's low but stable. And in Ukraine, uh, also, mostly older workers are employed in garment and shoe uh, industry, and uh, definitely it's hard for them to, to find uh, uh, another job. Next, please. Uh, so the last question we want to highlight is the uh, surviving strategies of those people with this poverty wages. Um, and there are several of them. One of them is, and they are common for both countries, one of them is safety nets, when people uh, can borrow a small amount of money from their friends or relatives just to be able to buy food until they get the next salary. Uh, but also official indebtedness, so they can, uh, if they need something more substantial, like to buy furniture or to have, uh, if they have some health problems, uh, they can borrow from banks or from an enterprise or from from a trade union. So it's another factor which binds them to this job because they cannot quit it until they are in debt um, at the factory. Uh, another thing is. Uh, a subsistence agriculture is also a huge issue and it's paradoxical and sad that uh, working at least 40 hours per week and usually more at the factory, they still have to work in their gardens or their fields, which are sometimes even quite big, just to have enough food to, uh, for their family. Uh, another uh, strategy is labor migration to the West when uh, some family member is abroad working uh, officially or unofficially in um, Western European countries to support the family. 
And uh, another thing which is common for both countries and especially in Ukraine is state, uh, state uh, subsidies for workers. So, um, for example, it's subsidy for public utility bills, which without a subsidy sometimes equal to the legal minimal wage monthly. And so uh, another uh, is also pensions, uh, which is common in Ukraine, because uh, if they are working pensioners, they also uh, receive pension from the state, or a disability pension if it's a person with disability. And the local transportation is relatively cheap because the local authorities subsidize a local transport system. But still some workers walk um, like 40 minutes to the factory and back from the factory to save five euro cents per day. Uh, so, paradoxically, Ukrainian state, in case of Ukraine, which is in crisis, uh, uh, subsidized survival of the workforce which produce for rich and famous Western brands. It's good on the one hand because people can survive, but it's bad on the other hand because uh, this, keeps, uh, this, this allows to keep labor cheap in the country. And despite all these strategies and sources of support, still workers live in harsh austerity. So they have to save money on everything, including food, and sometimes they say we don't eat meat, or uh, we try to buy the simplest food for ourselves and something better for our children. And uh, such things as like cultural life, which uh, for which you need money, like going to a cinema or to a cafe at least once a month, or going to a sea resort uh, during their vacation, like uh, inside the country, they are totally out of reach of this most majority of these people. Um, so, uh, you, Boyana and me, we tried to present this picture, what, what is behind the myth of the Made in Europe, and I think Bettina will talk far more about this. Thank you. Thank you. So, we will hand over now to Bettina, who is just preparing her presentation. And but uh, many thanks to Boyana and um, Oksana for like giving us kind of like the the Cliff Notes version of uh, of the research you worked on and uh, the especially pointing out not only that it's about working conditions but also and majorly about living conditions of people working in the textile and garment industry and I think like um <clears throat> i think my question now would be is that specific to ukraine and serbia or is it more part of like a regional or even international model of production and uh in the european periphery and that is kind of the question to hand over to bettina for the regional overview thank you very much yeah as you might suspect um it is it is a it is a structural problem of the garment industry. We have um, investigated uh, production countries in Europe, um, but in the end we have to say the, the endemic, the structural problems that are um, governing the supply chains and production networks in Asia also prevail um, in Europe. And I want to give you a sort of um, uh, uh, regional overview how the situation um, is in all the Europe or in 13 European production countries we have researched um, in the in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Oksana was already mentioning that you know in in, in reaction to um, the all the problems that were reported about Bangladesh, about um, um, China or the Asian production countries, uh, many brands started to advertise with "Made in Europe," "Made in the EU." Um, this is just one example, but there are many, many more other examples presupposing that the consumers would say, okay, in Europe then everything is fair, everything is fine. Yeah? And um, yeah, as we already said, uh, uh, the opposite is the case. Um, yeah, how many workers are actually uh, toiling in the, in the European garment in, or in the Eastern and Southeastern European garment industry? It is, if we... Um, count together all um, formal and informal workers, registered and unregistered. Um, we can, uh, we come up with uh, this number of 1.7 million. 1.7 million workers are toiling in this sector in those uh, 13 countries. And you can see that, for instance, uh, Romania 
is by far the biggest production countries in a country in all the among all the 13 countries we have uh, so far researched. One important country is also Bulgaria. Then one very important country actually is Macedonia. It's a tiny, tiny, small country, but every fifth, I think, every fifth woman is working in that sector. 80,000 um, 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 people are formally and informally employed in that sector. So it's a huge sector in many of the, of the uh, countries, and uh, the majority are women. 80 to 90 percent, the majority are women. Um, and that's why uh, we also try to find out what is the gender pay gap in, the, in, in that sector. And actually there's only one country that really has it in its statistics and that is uh, Slovakia. Here, um, women working in the leather and footwear industry earn almost 50% less than men, only half. They earn only half of what uh, uh, men earn. However, in all the countries, in all the 13 countries we have investigated, the garment industry is the worst paid manufacturing sector. The worst, the low, by far the lowest uh, uh, um, paid uh, uh, industrial sector. And sometimes the distance to the, to the best paid industrial sector is 1 to 10 or even 1 to 15. There's a huge, uh, you know, uh, 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 difference between uh, I mean, among the wages in the, in, the, in the industries. And there's a gender division on the, uh, at the workplace, and therefore we have this uh, huge gender pay gap. Yeah, in this, um, uh, in this uh, 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 infographics, we, we, we tried to show you um, the huge gap between, on the one hand, the legal minimum wage, and on the other hand, an estimated minimum living wage. Um, you already heard the figures for uh, Ukraine and um, Serbia. So Ukraine, it's 19%. Yeah, that means the, 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 the wages that the workers get is 19% of what they should get to lead a decent life. Um, Serbia, 29%. And you see that um, even for Bulgaria, it is only 18%. 18%. And Georgia is somehow a special a special case, there it is only 10%. Georgia actually um, last adjusted their legal minimum wage in 1999, and the legal minimum wage in Georgia for, for the whole economy is eight euros per month, eight, eight. Um, but we didn't take this eight euro as a, as a minimum uh, benchmark, we took the um, minimum wage for the public sector, which is slightly higher. So, um, and that is also relevant for, for the for payment of garment workers in Georgia. So in Georgia it's 10%, and actually the best country, so to say, is, um, is Croatia with 40%. But if you, for instance, compare with China, um, in China now I would estimate that this share is about 50-60%, because the government has increased the, the legal minimum wage. So all these countries are worse off than China. And what we, what already uh, Boyana and um, Oksana reported, um, yet this low minimum wage is not paid for many workers, in some countries for the majority of the workers, like Ukraine, Serbia and Albania, and uh, for the other countries it is, it very often happens. And the trick is, um, the, 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 the trick of the employers is to pay the legal minimum wage on paper, um, for, for, for workers, including overtime, yeah, including overtime. Um, that means you have to deduct the, overti the overtime to come to the real wages which is earned within the 40 um, uh, regular working hours. And that means the, the, the wages is then below um, the legal minimum wage. Yes. Yes, and this is uh, an, an aspect I would like to draw your attention to. Um, what is actually our responsibility here in, in Germany and also in other Western European countries? Uh, we found out that um, most of those 13 European countries we have researched produce either for Italy or for Germany um, uh, uh, in, in their garment industry. So Germany and Italy are by far, by far, 
the most important um, um, uh, destinations of, of the produced uh, garments and shoes. So it is German and Italian companies who are the main recipients of garments and shoes from those countries. And actually that is no uh, coincidence because in the 70s the German and the Italian governments have introduced a um, trade system that is called outward processing trade, in German passive Lohnveredelung, that, <laughs> that um, uh, Germany and Italy established with uh, then East Germany, Yugoslavia and the other Eastern European countries um, to have to outsource the labor intensive part and keep the rest in, within their own countries. It, that only partly worked out as we know now, but the consequence was that there are bad working conditions and poor wages and this is the case still now. And in order to make ends meet, the, the families or family members of garment workers um, come to Germany and Italy to work in informal and precarious um, uh, workplaces to, you know, to earn a bit to, to sustain their families. Yeah? So this is a sort of vice versa game um, between this region and uh, Germany and Italy and other Western European countries. Yeah. What are our recommendations um, to the various uh, stakeholders in the sector? Um, of course, the, the, our recommendations to brands and retailers, to fashion brands and retailers, are pay a living wage. I, I think that is uh, very clear. Then um, they should work together with the suppliers and subcontractors to remediate the reported rights violations um, and practice their human rights due diligence. I think that's quite obvious. Then, of course, we have uh, also um, recommendations towards the governments in the production countries. We have a, a real huge problem that the existing labor law is not enforced. The labor inspection that are state institutions in these countries are not functioning uh, well. They are sometimes not functioning at all, like for instance in, Gerber, uh, in, uh, in Georgia, there is no labor inspection. There is no labor inspection, although the European Union says it is such a great country and it has introduced such great reforms. So the, the governments should um, enforce their labor law. They, set, they should set a minimum wage level according to real costs of living. And um, what many um, organizations in those countries demand is Governments should support a system of free legal advice. Here our last um, uh, demand. Uh, free legal advice centers for workers in those areas where the garment and shoe industry is concentrated. Because many garment workers don't know their rights. They don't know, you know how to deal with, this, uh, with some, some situations. For instance, in, in, in Serbia we found a situation that workers signed uh, papers without knowing what is in the paper. So. Um, and they, could, they couldn't turn to anybody who, who would explain to them their rights in such, in such situations. So such free legal advice centers would, would be very important. Then to the EU and to our governments, um, we would recommend that um, on, on the European level there should be a minimum wage policy. I know it's a very difficult demand, um, but I think there's no way in the long run around that. Um, yeah, it is, I mean, the European Social Charter clearly demands a living wage. The, um, the UN um, Human Rights Declaration demands clearly a living wage, so this needs to be implemented, operationalized. Then um, the EU, together with uh, the International Monetary Fund and the European Central Bank, they link their loans with uh, the demand for um, restrictive wage policies. Th that means they tell the Serbian government if you want a loan then you have to keep your wages low in the public sector. Yeah? And this also needs to be uh, uh, um, uh, finished. Then um, finally we would advise the uh, European Union to, um, to observe the, uh, the, the implementation of grants they give to these countries, for instance, um, 
uh, Europe Aid is financing a lot of air conditioners in the Macedonian garment industry, but nobody checks if these air conditioners are switched on. And we found that they are not switched on. Yeah. So uh, the observance of the labor law and human rights should be connected with those grants. Yeah. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bettina. You can actually, don't, you're going in the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> because now we want to open the floor for debating, discussing, asking questions to your research, to also your recommendations. And this is the point where I hand over to my co-facilitator, David, who is working for Public Eye in Switzerland, which is also part of the Clean Clothes Campaign Network here in Europe. And now it's your floor and... Yeah. Thank you, uh, Wenke. Uh, good evening also from uh, my side. I would like to ask all panelists to join me here on the panel. A very warm welcome to uh, those who have already presented and to the other two I will introduce you when we are all sitting. Yeah, uh, we have uh, a bit uh, less than one and a half hours for a discussion. I am uh, very happy that we have uh, um, such a large and um, well-knowledged uh, panel here uh, tonight. We have already heard uh, the presentations from researchers uh, in the region, from uh, Bettina, uh, who is coordinating for CCC work in uh, the region. Next uh, to Bettina, we have uh, tonight here with us Luc Triangle. Luc is... Um, General Secretary, or Secretary General, I don't know which way, uh, of uh, Industry All Europe, which is the uh, Union Federation on the European level of the industrial unions. Um, so with, uh, yeah, a federation with many affiliates, affiliated unions in these um, countries. And we have uh, here with us uh, Larry Brown. And Larry Brown is uh, Vice Director, or uh, vice president, okay, of um, the uh, fashion brand uh, Esprit that uh, many might uh, know, and he is head of um, the global environmental and social um, sustainability. So he um, is experienced with question of social sustainability. So as uh, the issue we are talking here tonight. Um, I will quite soon open the floor uh, to all of you as well, so it's possible to raise questions here or add uh, further points. But before we do so, I would like to, to ask those who uh, so far have only listened to add uh, their impressions uh, about the situation in the region. And uh, Larry, I would like to, to invite you first to maybe uh, comment on the presentation and especially give us your view, you and your company. Of course, Europe might can give us maybe some figures how important the region is for, uh, for your company. Um, but my question is, next to these figures, do the, the information you get from audit reports, from visit in factories, from, from talks uh, you have with, with colleagues in the region, do they confirm these findings of uh, labor rights violation and generally a quite uh, terrifying uh, labor environment? Or would you say um, this picture, that you have another picture that, um, that, that encounters you? Okay, well I guess in direct response to your question, um, the wage figures are not wrong. The parts of the report that talk about factory working conditions um, obviously do not refer to every single factory in the country. Um, and I think our factories, compared to what is presented in those reports, are somewhat better. Um, I'd love to say they're perfect, but you'd know I was lying. Um, you know, we are the global apparel industry, and bad factories are what we deal with. Um, you know, and that, I think, when we talk about this issue, that's something we have to accept. If you go back to 1860 in the United States, 
in New York City when the first apparel factories in North America were founded, wages were too low then. So, you know, the other thing I think it's important to remember is we are not talking about something new here. Um, so in terms of, given that Southeastern Europe is quite a minor production area for Esprit, I must admit, um, significant but not important is the way I would call it, um, we don't have enough factories for me to give an across the board answer to say, you know, are their findings accurate, are they inaccurate? Um, you know, there are things we could discuss. Um, have I answered your question? Is it yeah, so pretty much you're saying you can confirm that the general figures on wages, well, they, 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 they are quite true to, to give a picture of, of the um, of the environment. What about the, the labor conditions? So we heard about, about wages, wage levels, but about uh, the special labor conditions, would you say these are problems that you find all over the, the garment in, um, uh, industry in, uh, in Asia and Europe that, that is pretty much the same? Or would you say there, there are differences here and the situation as it was described here with uh, forced over hours, um, over time for example, with uh, yeah, quite, quite repressive um, um, aggression against workers as well in these factories, this um, yeah, might, might be different from, from your ob observations the, in the region. The level of what you call aggression against the workers, um, that is one issue that varies a lot, not just from region to region, but from factory to factory. You know, we all hear, you know, one person can make a difference, and frankly, one person can make a difference, and that, that particular feature, the verbal abuse in the factory, some factories are really bad, some factories are not. That varies much more than the other factors. Um, you know, obviously the minimum wage figures they provided um, are accurate. You know, we, you know, they went to the- And are the wage place. levels at these levels? Yes, yes they are. Um, what we do not find in our factories is the endemic non-payment of the minimum wage. But, you know, not to say it doesn't happen, but we have not found non-payment to be an issue. But the problem is wages are that low. And so even when you're paying them everything they have coming, they're still not making very much money. Okay, just a final question at, at this beginning. How do you monitor the situation? How, where do you get the information from that, that gives you the trust of saying, well, the situation of wages is, is quite bad, but at least the dif there are differences between, between companies that produce there, and you say, well, ours might be a bit on the better end mm -hmm. of the spectrum. Um, we have a number of ways that we monitor it. We have, we're a member of the BSCI, and there are routine audits there, and I know the Clean Clothes Campaign loves the BSCI. Can you shortly explain um, what the BSCI is? Because maybe The Business Social Compliance might. Initiative. It's a, a business group that, um, it's 1,700 or 1,900 European brands that join together and have joint auditing where we share the reports. Um, their audit reports do have quite a reputation for not being great. But I have discovered in my six years at Esprit working with them that all you have to do is call the auditing company up and put the fear of God in them and they do a pretty good job most of the time. Not perfect, but a pretty good job. Um, to supplement that, we have our own internal staff that visits the factories. Southeastern Europe is tough because again, it's a very minor place. Um, our EMEA, we call it Europe, Middle East and Africa, person is based in Istanbul. But we try to get to the factories once a year where we do our own internal work. Um, and then obviously our quality people are there and we have kind of, they don't do a lot of social compliance work, but at the same time we do tell them, you know, if you see something, say something. So it's not a perfect system other regions we cover much better, but this is how we gather information, and I think we do generally know roughly what's going on. Thank you, Larry. Um, Look, um, your federation is uh, representing those who who do the garments, and mainly 
uh, female workforce. Um, I also ask you, what is your information base? Where do you get the, the information uh, about the industry? And second, do the inf these, these, these information match with what we have heard here? Or do you have other information that you would like to, to bring in here? Well, first of all, I want to congratulate the researchers with the research we now just received because it will be very useful information also for the trade union work that we do. So indeed, as you said in the beginning, uh, we are an, a European federation organizing workers in all industrial sectors, including also the garment sector, the leather sector, the footwear sector. And our affiliated organizations go all over Europe, including here in Germany with IG Metall, IG BC, but also in all these countries, all the sectors. So I can only confirm the findings from what we know, from what we have seen also recently. We have been in the last six to eight weeks in Serbia. We have been several times in Albania. We have been in Macedonia. We have been in Bulgaria. I have been personally also in the last months or in the months before to Romania, um, to other countries, to Croatia. If you talk to people, if you talk to the trade students, um, um, and if you talk also to the civil society organizations, um, these uh, facts, uh, these witness reports um, are more or less all in the same direction. Yeah? And they confirm what I just have seen and what I also have heard and also uh, the numbers are right. Uh, why is the minimum wage not paid? Uh, Bettina said people have to work overtime to get the minimum wage. Another reason why the minimum wage is not paid is because it's piece rate pay. If you don't get your pieces, you are not paid uh, the minimum wage because the minimum wage is based on the pieces that you have to produce a day. And if you are ill or you're not feeling well and you don't get the rate that you should have produced that day, you don't pe uh, reach the minimum uh, wage for that day. So if you want to reach the minimum wage, you have to work more. So it's linked to the way how you also count uh, your minimum wage. Um, so the, meet, the, the wages, and uh, Larry, uh, I'm not talking about Esprit here because I don't know the reality of Esprit, so I'm going here to give a very broad uh, personal view. The wages in that region, in that sector, are the lowest that you can find in Europe, in all sectors, and are unacceptable low. Yeah? Uh, so there is not any justification uh, for the wage level that we uh, encounter uh, in that part of Europe and in those uh, sectors. Uh, that's one point. Um, they are also below the poverty line, and I think that's really uh, unacceptable. We are here not talking, and it's actually not acceptable in any country in the world, let's be clear on that, but we are talking here about Europe, and we are here talking here even about countries which are candidate countries to the European Union. We are talking here about countries which are even member of the European Union, Bulgaria, Croatia. So it's actually not acceptable that we are not working harder on that and making more fuss on that because how many people in the public on the street know that many of the pieces of garment that we wear are not made in Asia but are made next door here in Europe. Yeah? So I think many of people don't know that our shoes that we here can um, buy in Germany or in other shops in Europe are sometimes and in many cases made in Macedonia because they have a long tradition, as Bettina said, in garment production but also in footwear production. So unacceptable low wages, um, long working hours, no overtime pay is, I would say, unfortunately, my experience more standard than it is exception. Yeah? Uh, thirdly, it was mentioned, but it's worth to mention it again, it's the importance of the informal sector. Uh, I was in Albania, I spoke to people which are also today here, child labor. We are not talking here about Vietnam, we are not talking here about Cambodia or about Bangladesh. In the informal sector we do have child labor. Um, in the informal sector, in, in the garment industry, in Europe. Uh, figures uh, we don't have, but it's practice uh, that kids have to help the mother, which are, is working from home, to reach the pieces that she has to produce 
uh, that day, that week. It's also reality. Um, a fourth point is indeed the general violation of working conditions. It's the way how you treat workers. Uh, how much are you a human being in that production chain? Um, so, and this is going beyond the pay, this is going beyond the uh, hours worked. Uh, it's the way how you are treated uh, by the shift leader, by the company. So also here, I think we can certainly uh, raise a lot of questions on the supply chain in the garment sector. The point is also, if I may, David, um, what is the role of trade unions there? Well, I talked about it with Larry just before we started. Um, I was in Macedonia, and uh, in Macedonia you have these free trade zones, uh, 10 square kilometers, fully surrounded by fence, and you can get there uh, all the subsidies that you want to get uh, from the government. Uh, you don't have to pay for your land, you don't have to pay for utilities, you even get a subsidy for every employee that you employ, and on top of it, we guarantee you that no trade union can enter that zone, so no trade unions are allowed. It's also reality. So there is certainly not uh, an easy environment for trade unions to get into companies. But trade unions are also not strong there. I have to admit that. They are not well established. They are not well structured. They don't have many resources. But it is also not made easy there to establish trade unions in companies. Important to know is also, if I talk about um, a neighboring country from Macedonia, Bojana, um, from, uh, from Serbia, it's, uh, what I experienced in, in that region is also that the local employers, um, maybe the local producers want to do a little bit more to the workers, but to a certain extent they are also victim because they are negotiating the pay and the price for the products with the brands. And the brands decide uh, what they pay for the piece of garment. And if it's too high, they go somewhere else. So the uh, local employers, um, I, we talked to them uh, in the last months uh, regularly. Uh, they also say, OK, we don't have any margin here to do much more than what we do now. Uh, because um, yeah, the pay that we get for the pieces is too low to pay higher wages. So, And that brings me to my first conclusion, if I may. There is a huge responsibility here uh, in the hands of the brands. And if we want to discuss uh, a, a, a game-changing strategy, uh, we will have to do it by uh, targeting, and I don't want to mean it here negatively, but by not targeting only the local producers, but by first targeting the ones that are paying for the pieces of garment there in that region, and that are the brands. And there we have to work on. Okay. Look, I think we, we will move into the question of responsibility and what we can do um, just now. But before we do so, let's conclude the, the round of giving information about the situation. And one question I, I need to, to ask you on this is, why are the trade unions so weak? Why are people not joining a trade union? Maybe you can also say how, how many members are there in, in trade unions? We have heard the number. It's an estimate of 1.7 uh, um, 7 million people, but how many people go into unions and, and why are the unions so weak? Well, why are the unions so weak? First of all, unions, uh, we are there in a region also where you have an heritage of the past. Yeah, uh, trade unions never had, since the change uh, in the region, never had a very positive image because they were part of the system. So you have to build new trade unions there with a new culture and also um, trying to change the general spirit that um, was linked to the existence of trade unions of the past in the past regime. So it starts from there. Secondly, it's also uh, to do with um, yeah, organization capacities. Uh, unions do not have today much resources to go into companies to recruit members, to convince members. And even if you then have membership, the membership fee is very low because the wages are very low. It's a vicious circle uh, where you, yeah, okay, in, uh, in Germany the unions are much richer because the wages are much higher and the fee is much higher. So it creates also a kind of upward uh, um, um, uh, spiral uh, to, to do things in the, uh, at the end of the day for workers and for, for, for members. 
So in general, trade unions today in that region do not organize more than 5 to 10 percent of the workers in the best case scenario. Sometimes it's much lower. Uh, you mentioned countries like Romania in the overview of Bettina. Well, there unions only represent a, fragment, uh, a, fr a fraction of the workers in the garment sector. So we know um, that we have to work on that uh, if we want to um, yeah, work as trade unions on the, on the situation in the, in the, for the garment workers and the footwear uh, workers in the, se in the region. Uh, that's for us certainly a, a point of uh, uh, where we have to uh, take action on. Yeah. Thank you. I think before we come here on the panel discussing on, on what is needed, what the responsibilities are, I'd like to, to uh, ask you in the audience uh, if you would like to, to comment, raise questions. Maybe we can take three, four questions now, maybe a bit on the, the assessments that we have made on the situation on the, uh, um, in the countries, in the industry. Uh, maybe also a question of clarification if things haven't been, been clear so far. So I'm asking um, in the audience if there are questions so far. Someone would like to, to bring in an additional view. Maybe you can shortly introduce yourself and tell you, please wait for the microphone, because we have a translation. Uh, wer lieber eine Frage auf Deutsch stellen möchte, kann das hier auch tun. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm Reinhard Lasker from German television, ZDF. Uh, just something I was not sure whether I understood right or wrong. Uh, Oksana, you told something about the heating or the climate that is uh, established but is not switched on. It's only switched on when, the, when uh, there is a control. But what was it precisely? It, because I, am, I, I think I heard the word subvention because I, perhaps I misunderstood. Could you please explain again? Or was, was I clear? I can... Uh, actually, we, we had a situation this summer in one factory, in a couple of factories, we had that uh, uh, mass fainting uh, of, of workers. But we had situation in one factory that there is an uh, uh, air condition system, but uh, it doesn't work properly. Uh, so uh, they tried to fix it. And after they fix it, they turn the temperature uh, 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 so low, so uh, uh, at the beginning uh, when workers came and the uh, uh, air condition system was fixed, it was like seven degrees in the factories uh, during the summer. So it's a just kind of uh, playing games with, uh, with the workers. So I, I cannot uh, provide you a better, better answer. Uh, so, um, where ex to what factories exactly, and and uh, like why is the EU financing these air conditioning systems? And then, I mean, of course, maybe they don't have a way of of, of checking if they're actually switched on. But like, yeah, how does that come about? Um, there's uh, the German, the Austrian, the Danish, various, and and also Europe eight uh, eight organizations um, are funding. Uh, in so-called uh, developing countries of Europe, like Macedonia, um, funding air conditioning equipment as, as grant, you know, to companies. Um, and we found that many of those air conditioning uh, uh, equipments are not switched on, are just not switched on. Yeah? And it's not only in Macedonia, it's in many other, like in Serbia and other countries as well. Um, the same for exhaust extraction system, you know, in the shoe industry, the air is very bad and um, uh, you need uh, ventilation and exhaust extraction system to put the, you know, there's a lot of glues, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, used chemicals, and uh, th this air needs to be exchanged, and there need to be a ventilation system, and this also, in most of the factories, is not switched on. But can you and guess why? Or say why? Are there different because regions? Because electricity costs money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when the workers ask uh, uh, why um, um, why aren't uh, those uh, things on, why, for instance, in Serbia we had the example that uh, even water taps were closed so that workers could not uh, get drinking water, right? And um, uh, then the, the, the management would say the, the, the water bill is too high, but the, wa the companies don't pay at all for the water. Because it, this is uh, given for free from the mu municipality. Yeah, this adds to the to the to the um, 
to, abs to this absurdity how, how, how workers are treated. And in, in, I think in, uh, the, the question you were asking was also referring to the... I still didn't okay. understand. Who is financing... Gids, Gids, for instance, Europe Aid, other development aid organization are giving grants to companies in those countries to uh, uh, buy air conditioning equipment. All right, maybe we cannot answer every question on this point here, but it's a point maybe to note and to come back uh, later. But uh, there was another question down there. And, uh yeah, I had a question to Mr. Brown. Like how, what's the strategy that Esprit as a brand would follow in case it comes up that in one of its like suppliers or during the supply chain, there are these kinds of contraventions? How would it react to that? Specifically with the minimum wage, we require the wage to be paid legally. Um, if we find a factory that we are looking at is not paying the minimum wage, then we don't go into the factory until they do. If we find a factory we've been using has not been paying the minimum wage, we require them to pay it. Um, you know, we do have the routine audits and routine visits. Every visit we make to the factory generates what we call a cap, which is a corrective action plan. We expect factories to fix these problems as we find them, and if they fail to do so, we do drop the factories. Okay, we, we, I think uh, starting now discussion talking about the responsibility, I take a last point from the floor and then we uh, go back to the panel and there will be a, another round then for, for additional questions and comments. Yeah. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Amna Yamin and I have been working with a consultancy. We, we actually go to factories and I was personally in Cambodia, in Georgia and I have this, I, as we were talking, we just uh, talk about BSCI or factory internal audits or especially in countries where the labor inspectors are a bit weak, I feel auditors play a huge role, but the audit system is weakly flawed. So you have these caps and you have these questions and you send these auditors to factories who check these things and give six months or a year to factories to quickly these things and then move out. So what I don't understand is that for a lot of managers who don't, who are under in, intense pressure to produce on certain number of certain number of pieces per week or per month for a very low amount of money, they don't understand that in that amount of time, how are they supposed to take out time and actually implement corrective, pla uh, corrective plans? So, if we are going to continue this discussion, we should also look that if that besides minimum wage, there are a lot of other <laughs> problems happening in this factory. Thank you. Um, Let's now talk about um, the question of, of responsibility and how to act. I think there's a point on, on, uh, um, on how to assess the situation, actually, is a, is a quite valid point. Um, before we, we come back and think, think this will be a main point, the responsibility, the responsibility of brands, I would like to, to ask you, from, from your interviews with workers, I know that you have concentrated on assessing the situation. But in your discussions with workers, did you, could you get a feeling of what workers think about the question of responsibility? So do they have demands and demands to whom? Who or, or not? Maybe you can just give us an impression about what, what the people actually working in this industry think about this question of, of responsibility and what needs to be changed. Uh, actually, in Ukraine, uh, on some factories, um, the situations happen when people just don't know whom they are producing for. At best, they can name a destination country and it could be just a guess. It's not really meaning they are producing for France or for Germany. It's not totally. It's uh, the problem that Ukrainian factories are sometimes on the lower stage of the supply chain. So they are uh, not direct suppliers sometimes. Uh, also the problem is that this discourse of um, brands being responsible for uh, in which conditions their um, uh, products are produced, it's basically totally absent in Ukraine outside like small cycles of um, people who care. 
Um, and I hope that this report, when we will produce, uh, we, when we will present it in Ukraine, it somehow will bring this discussion because the general discussion is that uh, it's so good that our labor is cheap and um, investors are coming to the country and no discussion of what is behind this cheap labor, what li living condition and survival. Also workers, uh, so sometimes workers just don't understand the, this link with brand. Sometimes they do and they talk like, okay, they like, um, I, I produce a jacket which they sell for, I don't know, uh, 200 euros and uh, my salary is half of that 200 euros per month. And so they feel this, but they don't feel that they can bargain with brands. And uh, because they are uh, mostly unorganized, they actually cannot bargain with brands uh, for that many reasons. Boyana, is your impression similar? Uh, uh, well, almost. Uh, uh, in Serbia, uh, uh, workers are mostly blaming uh, 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 the supervisors and the local management, sometimes our government. But uh, uh, yes, they are uh, aware of the, of the fact that they are producing very expensive uh, products uh, that they are not able to, to, uh, to buy, uh, however. Uh, but also there is uh, something is missing and I also hope that this uh, research will raise awareness and ha help it in that direction to put the finger on, uh, on, uh, uh, on a real uh, actor, actually, on the right actor. Okay, thank you. L Larry, I would like to come back to a point that, that Luke raised in, 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 in his first uh, intervention. He was saying he sees a clear responsibility of brands that brands actually put pressure on employers by paying maybe a too low price that would not allow for more flexibility on, on wages. So how does Esprit ensure that the price you are paying to your suppliers is actually well enough to pay uh, a good living wage and to ensure labor conditions are right? We have not benchmarked living wage. So actually within our costing process, I can't speak to that. We do benchmark the legal minimum wage. And so we have what we call an open costing model where when prices are negotiated with our vendors, who in some cases then negotiate prices with the factory, but when we negotiate the prices with the vendors, the wage bill is right there and it says, for this garment, you know, it's going to take this long to produce, it's going to cost this much to make it, and the labor is going to be this much in the garment. How much is it on, on average, for, let's say for a, for, a, for a pair of jeans and so, how much would be the, the labor in the price you pay to the supplier? Not only the end uh, price, but the price you the pay to the supplier. The latest figure I have, and, and I don't deal with the open costing sheets um, very often, but you know that's another department, and it's not that I cannot see them, it's just that I have a lot of other papers to see, so I don't read them very often. Um, I think labor, at this point, it's been going up as a percentage of the total price in the garments over the last 20 years. And I think now, on average, the total is somewhere in the neighborhood of 37%. I think, I don't know for sure. Um, 3.7, I think it's, it's, the labor cost is higher than 3.7%. 37. Well, there is a difference between the, the price you pay to a supplier and the end price. Maybe look, you, you, what, what, is, what is your figure on this? Uh, we are talking about the, the production uh, the place, price. the FOB price, the price uh, the supplier gives. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I want to see is, uh, okay, what is the retail price? Uh, what does a customer um, pay for his T-shirt or for his uh, sweater? Uh, what is the uh, cost of labor, production labor? I'm not talking about retail labor because there is also other labor related to the retail price. Yeah, but the product. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, but what is the, the cost of uh, production labor, the person that makes the, the, the garment piece? There I've seen, but okay, uh, uh, we have to look to the concrete uh, cases that it's actually only a, f a, a, a little fraction of the retail price that is actually going to the person that produces the garment. 
So, and that m brings the question to, and brings the point to, what does it mean for the retail price? And what does it mean for the profits that is made by the retailers and by the brands? If you would considerably, and I'm not talking here about just uh, 10%, I'm talking here bringing it to double, yeah? or into the direction of a living wage, because we're always uh, making, mixing up now minimum wage with living wage. So if, what, what does it make, what, what difference does it make then for the retail price or for less profit for the retailer if you considerably would increase the wage of the person that produced the garment? Because I'm sorry to say, but for me it's not enough as a garment producer that you say, okay, we have done what we had to do, we pay the minimum wage. No, because actually, um, why are you there? Because the minimum wage is that low. So it's a race to the bottom that you try to follow and you go to the cheapest country. So, and you are not clean, I'm sorry to say, as garment producer, if you say we have done what we had to do because we paid the minimum wage of that country. No, sorry, that's too easy. You, you, you have to go to a, a, a wage which is not then um, bringing people uh, to a life which is below the poverty line, even if they work 40, 50 hours a week. That's unacceptable. Look, give, give Larry a chance to answer your question about the question, how yeah. much does it make from, uh, from the end producer price and the question of margins? Well, if we tied the amount of money given to the worker to the retail price of the garment, then I believe in the last 10 years, the workers would have had a 14% pay cut. And this is another reality we need to look at. The retail prices for garments are not going up. Um, the brands are squeezed. You know, I don't know if you looked at, at Esprit's earnings report for the last year, but um, it was not good. And there are in our industry a couple of brands that are doing quite well, but I think if you look at the majority of brands, they're really not doing very well. Um, we could say that we probably are at the end of a, a business model here, and there's a big transition coming, and in 10, 15 years, many of us won't be here. Um, and this is when you talk about brands just raising the FOB that we pay, or just paying more money. Um, the first thing to understand is we are in a competitive market too. And if we just pay more for our goods, our customers are not going to pay us more for them. And so that means in a competitive market where margins are constantly being squeezed, that has an impact for us. Um, it has a very direct impact for our sourcing people because our shareholders expect them to make money and to get the best deal they can. And if they fail to get that deal, they're fired. And so therefore, you know, tying it to this is difficult. Yes, we're in the place where we can get the best deal, but, you know, they're pushed there. You're not, you're not talking about responsibilities of, of others that restrict your space to act. Would you say it's the responsibility of others, or would you say you have a responsibility as Esprit and others has as well? So maybe it's let's, let's stick a bit to the, the question of what the of us. you have. Of us. And you know, us as an industry, as societies, we have the responsibility on this. Um, you know, what I would like to see, the issue we have with an individual brand making a big impact is there are few factories that we use where we take more than 30% of their production. There are always other brands there with us. If the industry does not move in tandem or in, in concert, then it makes it very difficult for one brand to really move enough to make an impact. Um, so that's an important thing to see. Also, when we as a society need collective action, um, that's why we have a government. And you know, I look at the situation in Serbia, and I look at the situation in the Ukraine, and I know that our production there basically has slipped out from Turkey. The wages in Serbia and the Ukraine are cheaper than in Turkey. And so that tells me that there's a little bit of space there. Um, you know, for one thing, the cheap labor is not why we move there. Otherwise, we'd be moving all of our production there because it is cheaper than China. 
So there's space, but we need the industry to move together. We need our societies to move together. We need government to come in. You know, if the government raised the wages across the board, everyone was on a level playing field, then no one could complain. And we would all have to figure out how to adjust to it equally. Bettina, you're raising the question anyway. I wanted to say, to ask you, because CCC is, is quite often putting brands in the middle of the responsibility. Maybe you can answer directly um, to Larry. I would rather like to ask uh, uh, Larry, uh, so if you say that uh, uh, there is a responsibility of the governments, so why don't you in the Textile Alliance in Germany not ask the government to introduce laws to, um, um, uh, to claim the d due diligence of, of, of brands in their supply chains? I mean, as far as I know, in the Textile Alliance, nobody talks about binding rules, this playing level playing field you were talking about. I mean, uh, that would be definitely a, a, a huge uh, uh, progress. In Germany. You know, the Textile yeah. Alliance, well, the Textile Alliance is in Germany. We have a global operation. And what would be incredibly difficult would be to follow one set of rules in Germany, one set of rules in France, one set of rules in the Netherlands. I think that's what the EU is kind of about, isn't it? So, yes, having binding rules applying across the board to the entire industry would be great. But, you know, the textile business, I mean, forgive me, but Germany is not big enough to do this alone. Um, I am sorry, Larry. I mean, uh, uh, y y y all the excuses I have heard in the last 20 years from, from uh, brands you are reiterating. I mean, so why don't you um, uh, put pressure on the European Union? I mean, there is such a process. You know, the French, uh, 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 the, the European Parliament has tried to put that on the European level. But, um, I mean, I don't have to tell you that there, there was a sp uh, certain lobbies who prevented um, uh, this process from proceeding. So, um, I mean, so why, uh, why is there uh, no space in the European Union to talk about that? Equally like in Germany. Of course, Germany is, a, is an important country, but uh, uh, European rules would be better, of course. Yeah. Look, now already a brand and a civil society person at least agreed that the government should regulate the sector much better. Do the union see the same? So well then we can already <laughs> fix uh, and consensus here at least, a multi-stakeholder consensus. I would uh, certainly encourage uh, governments if they want to take initiatives to, uh, to do and to take initiatives, but to be honest, I don't count too much on that. Uh, because um, I think we have to take our own responsibility everywhere we, we can do it. And it's good to count on governments and on the EU and so on, and by the way, The treaty, the European treaty, forbids the European Union to take action on wages. Eh? Do you know that? Uh, it was mentioned here. I mean, you can't. Uh, the treaty, the current treaty of Rome, 60 years ago uh, signed, uh, uh, does not allow the EU to take any initiative which is directly late related to wages. Uh, and you, you had the debate here in, in, in Germany on the minimum wage. Now, finally, you have it. But there are still countries that do not want to have any legal minimum wage. So, But anyway... I think the point is that we have to take our own responsibility. So I don't count too much on governments, and certainly not when you deal with failed states in Southeast Asia or even in Europe, where you have governments where you can even say that they, to a certain extent there is still um, part, uh, presence of corruption in a government. So on that, on that level and on these governments, I don't count much. So what I think is important that Larry said, and I, I want to su uh, support that, is the, is, the, is the joint initiative that we need to take from brands. And uh, it's always okay if a brand doesn't do his work to target them and to name them and to blame them. But they will always tell you, why me and why not my competitor? Why don't you talk to him or to her? And why don't you blame him and why don't you name him? Because if you force me to increase my costs, because it's a cost for them, uh, yeah, then I'm in a competitive disadvantaged role, position towards my competitor. So that's why I and we, as European Trade Union, 
um, together with the civil society and together with the Clean Clothes Campaign, um, will start to work uh, now on Southeast Europe. And I want to uh, say a few words about that, if you allow me, David. So because we believe that if you want to change the reality in Southeast Europe, you have to create um, a platform where you invite first phase, force in the second phase brands to join. A platform to increase wages in Southeast Europe. And they will only move if they feel that they are not the only one. If they are part of others and other brands that will also be invited in the first phase and forced in the second phase to join that platform. Because if you bring them all around the table, then you put them all in the same position. And if you increase wages, and they all do it, yeah, then the disadvantage um, or the, the, dis the competitive disadvantage disappears because it's all the same. We are all in the same boat. And I think it's important to understand that if you want to go to a game-changing strategy, and not only in one company, because we are not talking about the reality in one company, we are talking about the reality in a sector. If you want to create a game-changing strategy in the sector, then you have to get them all on board. And the point will be to create that platform and to create uh, that strategy to bring them at a certain moment in time in the near future around one table to discuss the wage levels in Southeast Europe and to uh, force them indeed to take their responsibility. And then we are talking about living wages and we're not talking anymore about uh, uh, minimum wages, we are talking about living wages. And then we can move forward. And I think that's the way forward for us all together, actors in the sector, to have that um, joint view and that joint objective to create that platform. As Industrial Europe, we will work on that now. We have, um, and I can tell you um, uh, now, also support from the European Union, from the European Commission, uh, financial support uh, to do that. Uh, so we have a plan. Uh, we talked also with clean clothes here in Germany. We talked with uh, civ several uh, civil society organizations in the region already. We have a plan, we have an objective. Whether we will succeed or not, we don't know. We hope we will succeed. But at a certain moment in time, Larry, we will knock on your door. Uh, and we will also knock on the door of your, co of your colleagues. And we will say, listen, guys, it's uh, time to sit together and to do something. Because if you don't come to our table, we will do the same like we did in Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh Accord, uh, Yirki Raina was here, the General Secretary of Industrial Global Union, who signed and negotiated in 2013 uh, the uh, Bangladesh Accord, uh, where we now cover 70% of the supply chain in Bangladesh uh, on building safety, on fire and safety, on electrical safety. Well, there also you could only reach that if you have more than 200 brands around one table. Then they all say, okay, fine, we will all pay because it's for us all equal. We are all in the same position. Then they will take the responsibility and we will not convince them if we target them one by one and if they are not part of a, of a, of a, of a general platform. So I can't say much more about it because if we have good intentions and we have good objectives and we will create also a, a, a broad platform of support to get there. But I think that's in my opinion, and I might be wrong, uh, but this is, in my opinion, in our opinion, the only way out for the reality there in that region. But it's clear that we can't leave it like that. Uh, we must act here in that uh, sector and in that region. Maybe. Uh, Larry, we need an answer for you on, on, on this, on, on what companies do together with others. And for sure, you will have the time now to elaborate on this. But let me bring in one point you mentioned in your first statement. You were saying, the first factory opened in New York in 1860 or something, already paid too low wages. Mm -hmm. And we have seen many industry associations coming together, also discussing things, and never really cooperating to really improve this wage situation. So is there any game-changing moment that we could trust in industry coming together now? Or is it maybe a wrong hope? to hope that after so long time the industry might have a changed approach to solve a problem together? Well, I guarantee when this problem is solved, you will be slow, it will be painful, there will be a lot of yelling involved. 
Um, but we did have, you know, I think when the history of social compliance and the work of brands to improve working conditions in the supply chain is written, it's going to be divided into two eras. There will be pre Rana Plaza and post Rana Plaza. And, you know, that moment changed everything. And the Bangladesh Accord came together. And again, it has been slow, it has been painful, it has involved a lot of yelling, but it's actually done some really amazing work. And it's gotten everyone in the habit of talking to each other. So nothing is guaranteed, but I think we need to recognize that we are in a new era. Um, everyone is thinking about things differently than they used to. You know, my position back in the early days was in the PR department. What does that tell you? Now I'm in the sourcing department. And, you know, that's an important transition. So I think there is hope. Um, again, it's not going to be easy, but there's hope. Thank you. I give uh, opportunity for other questions from the floor. I already see one question here. Uh, I take first questions from people who did not already raise questions in the first round. So we have two questions here. Thank you. So, hi, I'm Maxi. I work in the garment uh, industry as well. And um, I must say I'm a little bit, like, I'm wondering about the fact that we are talking about this topic for years now. And it's always the question, whose responsibility is it in the end? So the factory is pushing it to the supplier, the supplier is pushing it to the brand, brand is pushing it again to the government, and it, it goes in a circle. Why, I mean, the main driver of this whole thing is the customer, isn't it? I mean, the customer is having the responsibility whether he is paying that low price or not and is saying, I don't want to buy this garment because it, c it can't be clean, basically, in the end. So I'm a little bit wondering why we do not put more responsibility on the customer's end, because in food, it's actually working. You can see how many people stop buying cheap meat, buying cheap, like, processed foods and go like vegan or vegetarian. And this is forcing the food industry to change and it's working. Why can't we do that with, with, with clothes? I'm, I'm passing that to Luke. Thank you. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's, let's take this uh, question uh, at, the, at the final round of the panel because I think it's a very valid point. I collect uh, some more comments and, and questions, please. Yes. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Mark Hagen. Um, I'm a labor and trade union researcher. I do quite a lot of work with Industrial Global Union, um, specifically on uh, textile and other industries in North Africa. Um, I have one question, uh, which would be uh, sort of connected to uh, the uh, profitability of the industry. And, and you said um, your, your earnings were not so great over the last couple of years. At the same time, I, I recently saw a press release that was pretty fantastic, uh, calling f uh, something about a tripling of uh, profits of the uh, S3 group as a whole. Um, so that was Reuters. Maybe they were off by, by yeah, a but big mark. You, I don't what know. do you get when you take a negative number times three? You're restructuring, as I recall. So that's yeah. part of the whole. Yeah, we had, that's part we had of the whole deal. That's the strategic question that that the company decided on, right? So let's let's contextualize that a little bit, at least on that on that note. Um, more importantly for me right now, because uh, um, you talked about uh, Luke, uh, you spoke about um, the uh, act and um, the uh, the agreement. Is there a global framework agreement with this free at this time? Do you know? Um, on the global level with Industrial, um, and is the company negotiating? Um, I know that other act signatories, um, in this case for the Bangladesh Accord, um, are at the same time or have already uh, signed two GFAs. Um, and uh, these are companies that are highly competitive, uh, very profitable, and on top of that, are quite compatible in our trade union and labor and social uh, work in, for example, um, the Middle East, North Africa region, such as the Inditex group with the Zara brand and so on. I take a third question. We, we, we divide it up then who answered which question, okay? But uh, third question here. Oh. Thank um, my name is Julia Truhl. I would like to um, add to that comment that it's the com consumer's responsibility. Yes, there are consumers who have enough money, 
have enough brain and have enough time to research to buy responsible sourced goods and food. But in a, in a current time we are living where the governments all over in this neoliberal world pushing salaries down and making it very difficult for people to live with just one job. There are many people who need two jobs now to survive. You can't blame the customer then for buying cheap food and buying cheap clothes if they are not getting paid enough. So as pre, on one hand, um, you can see that people are paying less for your um, clothing and that's the result of um, the inequality um, rising in our society because if our salaries would be fair, we could pay fair prices to the products. So it's the, it's the system destroying itself. Uh, personally, I don't understand why the politicians don't understand this because most, most uh, businesses I'm talking to, they understand very well that the problem is in that downward spiral that at some stage will collapse the system. So um, I would like to know um, why, coming back to that point, I haven't understood why the um, GEZ uh, would pay um, for air conditioning in Macedonia if it's not getting used. That doesn't make sense. Why do we pay subsidiaries to companies that are part of this downward spiral? I would really like to know under which circumstances our taxpayers' money is being invested in air conditioning, uh, if it's then not being used. Okay. I, uh, final question goes to, to Mario. <coughs> My name is uh, Mario Iverkovic. I'm, I, I'm from Novi Syndicate from Croatia, from this region. Uh, and uh, I have a few comments and one question to Larry. Uh, we are not part of industry all, but I submit everything what looks said here. It's a very good initiative. Uh, I will uh, give some facts about it, uh, you know, about prices. Uh, because uh, we are not included in any negotiations with brands, only with local managements, and we cannot do with them nothing. Because if we... If we have success in negotiations, uh, workers will stay without jobs. It's very, it's terrible situation for any union. Uh, but I heard here one point of view, Larry. You haven't benchmark uh, living wage, but you have benchmark uh, legal minimum wage. I think it is mistake of your and other brands because uh, it's very bad benchmark. You know, but it is uh, something, one problem, what we have in all region, but we all of all of us know that it comes. You, you spoke about government. Our governments are under the pressure of European government, and it is the reason why we have a uh, very small minimum wage. You know, they they cannot improve it because, in this case, uh, World Bank. Uh, other banks will not uh, give uh, credits and so on, but brand, brands can change it. But I agree with Luke, we have to act to them, first friendly and after that with pressure, of course. I'm sure that we will have to make pressure. And uh, only one uh, point about uh, lack of, uh, uh, of this... Uh, you know, about trade unions, why people don't trust to trade unions. You know, it's very hard to work union job in this in such circumstances where you haven't good, uh, good state, you haven't uh, inspections. I will give only one, uh, one uh, uh, from my experience, one thing what happened to me. I came to labor inspection with uh, 100 workers which were illegally worked for one employer. You know what happened. Labor inspections found 500 more 
illegally workers in the same company, but these first hundred stayed without job. They lost jobs. This is situation in our, in our countries. And uh, then how can you do a union job if you cannot <laughs> go to legal uh, institutions? They will not give you support. We only, the only solution is to be very, very, very strong, but it is very hard job. If I have in some company 80, 90% of workers, then I can do anything what I want. But again, I cannot improve salaries because brands don't give enough money. Again, we have problems. Even when we are very strong, we cannot do it, and we have to, to, to make these common activities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for um, the questions and, and additional uh, information here. Um, there were two questions I would like to, to pick out for hopefully quick answers. The first one was the one on the global framework agreement. The question is Esprit negotiation and global framework agreement maybe short to explain what this is? Maybe you can introduce, say, what a global framework agreement is and then in what process you at Esprit are. Okay, well, a global framework agreement it's interesting, we've been involved with ACT for two years. We've been in the Bangladesh Accord for five. Um, you know, my counterparts at Industrial, I know them fairly well. And they had never mentioned a global framework agreement. I had assumed that we were too small. You know, we are 1 14th of the size of Inditex. Mm -hmm. And so the amount of work that Industrial would have to do with a relationship for an agreement with us would be great. But you would consider to, to go into Actu a framework agreement? Actually, we had the first discussion about it about two weeks ago. And I'm waiting for some more information, and we definitely will consider it. All right. Maybe this is an invitation for Luke to follow up on this. <laughs> Let's not follow up on this here, on this mm -hmm. panel. Just the, the other question that was raised by, by two persons on the question of the role of consumers. Um, I already noticed that there have been some quite different questions on the same topic. I don't know if, if it's possible to give a short answer on this, but maybe someone wants to try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too many people. I, I think it's, uh, it's really a, a, a comparison that doesn't work, because when it's about food, it's about, for many people, about my health. It's about me. When it's about textile, it's about somebody else. Uh, so I think uh, the comparison doesn't really work in that sense. So I think where does a consumer can find in the shop where he buys his uh, garment piece uh, more information about um, where it is made, in which conditions is it made, you have to guess. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I think there is also a lack of information. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you have a T-shirt that costs in 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 a, in, in a shop uh, 20 euro, and tomorrow if you have then uh, a price of two 20 euro and a half, or even a little a little bit more, I mean I don't think that the consumer will make a difference uh, and not buy the T-shirt anymore. Uh, to be honest, uh, so they will uh, just buy it. Maybe um, um, not all consumers, but most of them will. And I can only support also the remark made by uh, you um, before. Um, yeah, indeed, we have uh, in Europe also uh, a domestic market, and that the domestic market has to be driven by good salaries and by high wages. And that's and I, that's my concluding point. That's why we, as European Trade Union Confederation, launched earlier this year this European-wide pay rise campaign because we think that better working conditions, better societies, starts with high salaries. And that's at the end of the day also good for companies because it leads to consumption. And if you want to have people that they have money to buy more qualitative goods that are also made in better conditions, yeah, then you have to also provide good salaries. So good salaries is an engine for a good society. Thank you. I'm um, not at the moment, but you will have uh, your point now. I just I need to we need to sh um, just close sharp. Therefore, I have. Uh, you will all have another opportunity to have uh, two minutes uh, just to, for your final statement. Um, the question on um, um, on the, the uh, heating or cooling system, I beg your pardon, but I will not raise it here. Maybe there is an opportunity to follow up after the event. Um, just um, 
to, to come to an end at uh, this discussion here, I think we will continue for sure um, in, 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 in many places and for quite a long time. But if I, uh, Boyana, I ask you for maybe a positive vision, if you would say, in you look five years ahead, just imagine a better situation in five years for garment workers that you might think it is possible to achieve in five years. What would have been your contribution to this? So what fight are you fighting to achieve an improvement in this sector? I, I have to say that unfortunately I'm not very optimistic about uh, the future uh, of the region in general, and especially of low-paid workers. Uh, but what we definitely need uh, uh, at the ground is, okay, we talk, talk a lot about responsibility uh, uh, of the brands and uh, unions here from Europe, but we also need at the, uh, at the ground there in the region, in Serbia, we need... Uh, first of all, stronger unions who could support uh, workers and with whom you can uh, uh, cooperate from, from here. And also we uh, in the region uh, um, need a kind of a, a, political, a serious political actor that could uh, push for uh, changes uh, and uh, we, we are, uh, <laughs> my contribution is that uh, we are trying, because I'm also a member of Left Summit of Serbia and we, like part of informal leftist scene in Serbia, are trying to provide uh, maybe conditions for, for, uh, um, for the uh, better uh, political uh, opportunities in the future in general. So you mean making this a general political topic? Yes, yes, we definitely need this, like... Uh, 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 bigger uh, structural changes and not to move from factory to factory, from brand to brand and solve it like single issues. We need uh, to approach it, as you already said, like uh, um, generally, more in general. Like we have, we need to have like a general approach. Oksana, will you continue this, this work on this field and do you have uh, an optimistic perspective or is it unrealistic? Uh, yeah, definitely we will continue. Like we now have a um, thing also thinking about defining the um, uh, living wage with the methodology of the Asian floor wage, uh, from, uh, Asian floor wage campaign. But it's still, I mean, so anyway, we will continue. Uh, but I'm unfortunately I cannot provide you an optimistic view, uh, and I really doubt it can be done on the country level. Really, the only answer I see within this economic system is uh, international legally binding regulations of the operation of transnational cooperation. Do I believe it can happen? Mm, <laughs> I mean, following the, all the discussions like in ILO conferences and everything, it's like a um, hard issue. Um, and um, speaking about like local actors, the problem that in Ukraine, um, government sector is relatively insignificant to other sectors. And even independent unions, they prefer to be engaged into transport sector because it's infrastructure, into mining and steel sector because it's far bigger portion of production and of export. So locally, um, Honestly, we found not a single independent union in the sector. And uh, attempts to create an independent union were basically repressed. There were some. And not easy. Larry, your final uh, words, but also I, I must ask you this question, because you painted a bit here a picture of a company under pressure with a business model at the end, probably. And you were saying there was a game-changing moment four years ago. Will Esprit in five years have a completely other business model that might be more sustainable? Are you working on this? I, I'm not talking about smaller changes. I'm really talking about coming out of this crisis that is a systematic crisis, mm -hmm. probably, and looking for an alternative business model that might be more sustainable also in economic terms? Yes, we are. Um, 
you know, my career at Esprit has been fascinating. I've been there six years. I started in August. In October, they announced restructuring. And so the entire time I've been with the company, we have been restructuring. Um, you know, there are changes. There have been a lot of changes up to this point. There will be changes going forward. Um, whether it's going to succeed or not, I don't know. Um, you know, and luckily it's not my job to know, so I just let the people who are experts in that. But, you know, the discussion that I hear is the relationship between online shopping and bricks and mortar. And the online retailers are making quite a lot of money right now. Retailers who have a lot of shops are not. And yet, if you don't have the shops, you don't have the presence. So, you know, I'm optimistic about conditions in southeastern Europe being better in five years than they are now because I know it can't go on like this. Um, the larger apparel industry also can't go on like this. Okay, I think 50 people here in the room will monitor closely <laughs> what business plan Mike can up. Mm. But I, we know from marketing, we, we want uh, a surprise and uh, maybe the surprise shopping. will will come soon. We will, we will stay tuned. Um, I ask you, Bettina, at the, at the end of this uh, event, as CCC is, is organizing these, these researchers now, now this event and is having this discussion for a long time, actually, do you see uh, a possibility for an improvement in five years? And what would be the contribution of a civil society trade union campaign as the Clean Clothes campaign is to this? I think um, it will it will depend um, whether trade unions and uh, clean clothes campaign civil society can work closely together or not. Um, I think that is the most important um, uh, game changing factor for us. And um, in the case of the accord, we work together well, um, and uh, we can only change something if we really um, 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 work together. Um, whether we will reach uh, what Oksana said, an enforceable or binding legal framework or framework at all uh, for the industry and for global supply chains, I don't know, but definitely this will be our aim also, to have something, uh, whatever, a UN treaty, an accord, an, uh, a brand agreement, a global framework agreement, but I think the most important is it, it must be enforceable, it must be binding, and uh, to, to end those endless talking rounds like in the Textile Alliance and you know where, where there are not really anything uh, coming out. But l uh, may I have one word on the role of the consumers? <laughs> one word. <laughs> I mean, okay. I mean as clean clothes campaign, as clean clothes campaign, I have to say something about that because I mean this is our main business to mo mobilize consumers, you know? And if you see this card, I think we have printed it about 50,000 times, and this is the most successful means uh, uh, our, of our tools we have ever produced, you know? There are so many consumers. I think it, we, we don't have the problem that there are not enough consumers aware of the uh, working conditions. I mean, the fact that we are sitting here is a result of that. That there is, uh, uh, the fact that, that there, there is this tremendous social auditing business, I always say they should pay us some, uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, you know, contribution, because without the Clean Clothes campaign, we wouldn't have the social auditing uh, uh, business, I would just claim, you know. And I think there's such, the whole discussion about um, um, uh, uh, social compliance and uh, blah, 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 I mean, that is um, uh, um, intended and unintended um, outcome of the of the clean clothes campaign and the bad message is also the more expensive brands are even worse in in terms of human rights um, 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 compliance because their margins is, uh, are higher and they could really really afford better wages for their workers and um, uh, uh, the difference in the between the cheap and the the, the, the luxury brands are in a production I don't know where the difference should be. It's the same, you know. 
Um, so I would like to really make that uh, 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 very clear. Without consumers' awareness, we would not be sitting there here, but the uh, consumers cannot fix the fast fashion business. It is the brands and it is the poli policy makers who, whose uh, you know, responsibility it is to, to improve uh, uh, the, the rules. Right. I promise that we will end sharp. So uh, the panel discussion is over. The discussion certainly is not over. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you, the whole audience uh, here, for your contributions, uh, for your important questions. I would like to thank all here on the panel for your willingness to discuss with us, for your research you have done, for the work you're doing in uh, the different areas where you're working. I would like to thank those who contributed to this work that are not here, co-researchers, workers who were willing to give interviews um, in order to uh, give us information we need for this work. I would like to thank the translators for this event, for uh, your assistance here. and thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for their support for this work and for hosting us here uh, tonight. Certainly, I know one of us needs to rush to the airport now, but the others might have 10 minutes more to stay on, so if you have additional question you would like to follow up, maybe there is an opportunity just to do it directly. For example, ask Larry if he ever got one of these <laughs> cards, would be an interesting question. Uh, thank you to all of you and good evening. <laughs>